the Around the NFL podcast. Our conference champions in their hearts. From the Chris Wessling podcast studio, it's Around the NFL. Championship Sunday edition. I am Dan Hansis. I am joined by heroes, Greg Rosenthal, Mark Sessler. Gentlemen, it is set two weeks from tonight. 3.30 p.m. Pacific kickoff on Fox Television, State Farm Stadium, the setting in Glendale, Arizona, the Kansas City Chiefs against the Philadelphia Eagles, two 16-3 teams, two number one seeds for all of the proverbial marbles. Let's go. Let's go. This is... Uh... This is exciting. It also feels like the finality of it is very sudden. We're coming off this AFC Championship game that we're going to get into it, but it does feel crazy that like this is our last time here recapping games for the season. We'll be at State Farm Stadium. Uh, and you could have played out the whole season, or you could have just read the NFL.com Super Bowl predictions before the year and just skipped it all, and you would have seen I, I had Chiefs over. Wow. It's, it's Eagles somehow, over Chiefs it's to somehow start. Yeah. comes down wow. and once again to Greg talking about Greg <laughs> and Greg's picks. Espe- at the top of this show, especially. That, that, that's what makes it funny. That's disturbing to me. <laughs> but you know what? You did pick that. And I think you had in an even bolder choice, Patrick Mahomes as MVP. Another mm, victory for you. That's true. That's true. How do you come up with these picks anyway? Hey, I guess we can skip the next two weeks of uh, <laughs> predicting the game and talking about it no, since we know enough. what's going to happen. So here we go. We're going to go over both games today in detail. Um, the, the second game, the game that just wrapped before we came on today, absolutely the better game of the bunch. But don't tell Eagles fans that. They love the first game uh, against the 49ers. Of course, it's one of those games where you got to give credit to the winner. But as a football fan that is just agnostic on this, you wish you maybe saw something different. You wish you saw a full-powered Niners team against a full-powered Eagles team. But sometimes the football gods don't give us what we want. But again, Eagles fans don't care, and nor should they. Let's head to the link. It is second down and five. Hurts gives it off against Sanders. Five into the end zone. Kelsey. Jason Kelsey. What an unbelievable job. Kelsey drawn my ladder off that left side. And Miles Sanders scored his second touchdown of the game and the second of his career in the postseason. Miles Sanders. Have a day, kid. Two touchdowns on just 11 carries. Jalen Hurts threw 120 for 121 yards. That's all right. Didn't need to do much uh, because the Philadelphia Eagles overwhelmed the San Francisco 49ers 31-7. They are back in the Super Bowl for the fourth time, the second time in, I believe, five years. And you know what, Greggy? Credit to the entire organization and start For me, anyway, with Howie Roseman, Jeffrey Lurie, of course, the team owner. This is the first uh, team in NFL Super Bowl history to get back to the Super Bowl within a five-year span with a different quarterback and head coach. It was once, of course, Doug Peterson with a combo of Carson Wentz and, of course, Nick Foles. And now Nick Sirianni, Jalen Hurts to the big dance. Yeah, I as you guys know, I'm loyal to football. So this game was... uh, a disappointment to be one sided, but I don't want to start with the disappointing aspects. I want to start uh, with loyal the loyal to football, the ways that I, I think the Very Eagles Greg centric start to the program. This game. I, I, know, surpri- I know I'm enjoying it. I'm surprised you started with us, with me. They, their pass rush dominated like that started with us. <laughs> well, it started with me. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I, I'm surprised. I'm so surprised we're starting with this game because it now feels like such an afterthought in this game because of the injuries and everything. But I think what shouldn't get lost is that the Eagles two lines won their battles. And so even if the 49ers had stayed healthy, we'll never get to see that game. I don't know what it would have been, but I know that the Eagles defensive line housed the 49ers early and often early second quarter. They already had had three sacks. The two injuries that the 49ers quarterbacks had unfortunately came because they couldn't protect their quarterback. And it's been a near historic Eagles pass rush all year, Mark 70 sacks 
in this season, three guys getting over 10 sacks. And to me, that was the reason why the 49ers were going to have big time trouble winning this game, even if they kept their quarterbacks. Yeah, when you get this version of Hassan Reddick and Javon Hargrave and the rest, I mean, they made life very difficult for the Niners out of the gate. I think no matter who was a quarterback, it would have been a different environment than we've seen San Francisco thrive in in the past. Uh, Philly, I mean, I guess, you know, critics of the Eagles will say you got a totally down on their luck Giants team a week ago, and then you got this version of the Niners. I kind of don't really care. It's not really the way I see this because the Eagles simply have performed at a super high level almost this entire season. They've been one of the most consistent teams. What happened today uh, doesn't diminish that for me, although I think if you're a Niners fan, we just, we got stole, we got, we were basically robbed of what would have been, I think, a titanic game because San Francisco's defense, I mean, they could do nothing on offense, but their defense kept them kept them in this for a stretch of time. But then when you get Brock, Pur- Brock Purdy back in there and you cl- it's clear he can't throw. They're a one dimensional team and they're, hand- they're just essentially handing the ball off as the clock is ticking down. That's not an NFC title game. That intrigues me. Yeah. So this game is it, it really gets decided very early on. You have a. A fourth down and three near midfield. Uh, Jalen Hurts, they stay on the field. Sirianni goes for it because that's what the Eagles do. They're an aggressive team. Throws a nice ball downfield. Devontae Smith makes an amazing acrobatic play. Uh, Not a catch. uh, Very close to a catch, but the ball is moving as it's touching the ground. Terrible job uh, by somebody. And somebody could tell me who did a bad job here because you could say it's Kyle Shanahan for not recognizing Devonta Smith in a, in a kind of a panic, uh, telling his teammates to huddle up and get the playoff. Always a pretty clear indicator to me when sure. the receiver's doing that, that he doesn't think he caught that ball. But how about this, Greg? And we've talked about this all season, that almost every play is reviewable now because the eye in the sky and the NFL's new method, which is ceaselessly explained as being this great benefit to the league and has helped the games, and I agree, like, where is the stoppage in the play from that end of things also? that Bottom line, and we saw it again throughout today, just like we've seen it throughout the season. The officiating is not up to snuff. A huge early turning point in this game is on a catch that actually wasn't a catch. I just want to start there in terms of breaking yeah, I, down the game itself. I think we should go through the whole game because it was closer than now you look at the final score, 31-7, and what happened to the quarterbacks. It feels like it was predetermined, we'll but it there. was closer for a while. It was fourth and three from the 35 on that play. Okay, 35. He throws uh, a good pass, considering he was rolling left. The Great play ball. looked over to Devontae Smith, who makes an even better catch, or so we thought. I don't blame anyone here. I really don't. They, they, he caught that ball and hit the ground with about 10 minutes, 22 seconds or so left. They had the next snap on a no huddle 20 seconds later. And we got one replay. So that's what Kyle Shanahan's basing it off of. And by that replay, there was no way to tell that he didn't actually catch it. And I think Greg Olson in that moment saying, what a great catch, absolutely influences the 49ers from not challenging it because they didn't see anything. And sometimes when Jim Nance says, oh, I don't know if that was a catch, then they end up challenging it. So I don't really blame Shanahan. But I have a hard time blaming like the NFL for not quick spotting that because can they get all the angles in that quick of a time? I think it was just like a bang, bang play and they did a good job hurrying up and it's unfortunate. What I read, the NFL, this Hawkeye technology feeds almost virtually all the replays back to their command center. This is the only game, game being played. Whatever it was, it wasn't seen. They score a touchdown, the Eagles. Right, we saw the replay like 40 right. seconds later. So I'm just saying that, uh, you know, and I think it was more like if you're a Niners fan, just Devontae Smith's reaction. Maybe yep. in the first quarter, the first right. half, maybe, you know, we we stop playing and take a chance because that's such a huge play in the game. Then on the sixth play from scrimmage for the Niners, Brock Purdy uh, gets hit. Uh, I think it's Hassan Reddick who has been playing out of his mind. Um, bends his elbow back. He's out of the game. And it's just crazy, Mark. And he does come back in an emergency scenario, and it turned into farce at that point, um, unfortunately, um, that that is now a Niners team that had won, what, 12 straight games that was in the NFC title game, had lost their third starting quarterback to a potentially serious injury, this time with the timing at its worst. And to the credit, uh, and this is to Purdy's credit, the way Josh Johnson looked in this game, which is like what a lot of guys deep on the depth chart at quarterback usually look like. I think that's what a lot of people expected Purdy to look like. And we thought the Niners season would have been over seven or eight weeks ago. 
that's that's what usually when a, a deep backup comes in the game, they couldn't get anything going once Johnson was in, involved until he went out of the game. No, I get you. You hit the point where Kyle Shanahan and the creativity and the acumen and the experience of tutoring and growing quarterbacks couldn't do anything at this point. I mean, Brock Purdy, we, we all wondered, would he melt down? It's just a game that leaves a lot of unanswered questions. It's the game that we'd want to see what would have happened here because yeah. I, I also think the thing that had nothing to do with Brock Purdy on another level, though, was that the Niners, for the first time in a while, came. I thought they were totally unhinged on defense with the penalties. I mean, they kept... Eagles drives alive. There was the roughing, the, the the punter penalty that kept things going. Hufanga had a big one. There was a personal foul, a, a string of personal fouls and a face mask on Dre Greenlaw that just kept the Eagles alive. And really, if you had taken some of that away, I think this game is a little bit different, but you can't get past the quarterback injuries. Right, because after that touchdown, to be fair, Dan, the 49ers defense forced three straight punts. Right. And they allowed mm-hmm. a total of 13 yards on those possessions. Now the 49ers offense is dealing with Purdy's injury. And again, that came from a good player, Hassan Reddick, taking advantage uh, of how they set up their defensive line and that a tight end was blocking him. So that's coaching, that's execution, that's player. And that helped get, uh, unfortunately, Purdy get hurt, but hit. That would have been a fumble either way, a turnover. Uh, But then the 49ers go and make a touchdown drive. Uh, they they trust Josh Johnson a little bit. He makes a, a couple plays, uh, or rather, Purdy, um, yeah, is out at that point. They they get the touchdown after McCaffrey runs him over. It's seven to seven. That was a great run and, by McCaffrey. You know, My as goodness. someone who's rooting for the Eagles here, I'm actually feeling quite nervous at that moment. It's fourth down. It's on the Eagles' 35. God, they're gonna punt it away again. Four straight punts where they don't even get a first down, and that's the moment where, not to our surprise, Nick Sirianni goes for it on fourth down. In Almost every any other coach in the league, I don't think, goes for it there. Certainly 10 years ago, no coaches would have gone for it. Uh, he picks it up. Uh, they end up getting the touchdown later that drive. And to me, that's like where the game changed right there. And if he had blown that, let's say, and it had gone sideways from there, people would be killing Sirianni. And yet I don't feel like in these scenarios, anyone gets any credit for going the, for the fourth downs. No, I totally agree with that. And so the game is 14-7. They're still all right. They're okay. The, the Niners have the ball with two minutes to go down seven. And then again, you know, Josh Johnson has been on a hundred teams uh, by now. And you can't, you can't kill the guy because there's a reason why he's hanging around the league this long. He must be a really good guy behind the scenes and uh, uh, someone you want in a quarterback room, but that's a killer turnover. Then a snap that goes right off his hands. He kind of goes down to get it. He has the opportunity to pick it up, but it doesn't work out. <laughs> Turn it over. The the Eagles go down the field again and score, and it's twenty one seven. And it kind of felt at that point that the game was over. Yeah, and it basically was. At yeah, that point. it was because there's no way out at that situation with what you have going on at quarterback. And I mean, it goes beyond just the turnover too. The, there there were three delay of game penalties. They just were disorganized. It's like you can't run your offense, and it was only a matter of time because yes, the defense was doing all it could, but you're watching if you're the Eagles. Defense, you're thinking, wait a minute, there's no one in this game that can really throw the ball. Then when you bring Brock Purdy back in, it's like you're you're essentially playing a Pop Warner attack at that point. Well, that yeah, the game's over at that point. But I, I do think it's worth pointing out that you're right. There were all these penalties that helped the Eagles get that touchdown to make it 14-7 after the, the fourth down conversion that I'm talking about. None of the penalties were, and, I, and I've seen a lot of complaining today, and there has there was some bad calls, and, and 49ers fans complained. All those penalties were clear and obvious penalties. Oh, I think so, they, too. They, they were good calls. Uh, I've seen a lot of criticism being like, why is Kyle Shanahan being aggressive in that two-minute scenario? And I think it's just anger that like we have to get mad at something or someone the first play of that drive by the way is a nice throw by Johnson first down to Samuel at that point it's kind of go time the next play is a, a perfect shotgun snap and he just fumbled gotta execute. it like yep. if, if they were being as conservative as possible he could have fumbled the snap too it was just a fumbled snap which you hate to see a game kind of end on that and there's and I know the 49ers defense played pretty well 
but there's no rule they have to allow the Regals to run right through them there, that either of the two rushing touchdowns in the first down first half were absolutely untouched. When this game was in doubt, the first eight drives, the Eagles had 130 yards rushing, which would have been the third highest the 49ers gave up all season, just in those eight drives. So they, they were getting it done relative. It wasn't easy, but they were moving the ball somewhat on the ground. Let's hear from the quarterbacks on both sides. Let's start with Jalen Hurts here. Uh, Hurts, who didn't have a big statistical game, but you could just see it in these two weeks, the way the team responds when he's out front and he's leading them. There's a great shot of him after the game, uh, kind of alone going through his phone, smoking a cigar. Uh, this is Hurts' time, and he'll be a big story this week. And it's easy to forget now that when he was drafted, the Eagles had Carson Wentz, and the idea was that they kind of were set, set at quarterback. And that obviously is something that motivated Hurts because he made a passing comment earlier in the press conference about how, you know, some people, they didn't want to draft him to Philly. And then he was asked a follow-up about that off-the-cuff remark. You know, there was a a big surprise to many. big surprise to many. But my favorite verse, uh, you know, I went through a lot of stuff in college and it kind of stuck with me, John 13, 7. You may not know now, but later, later you'll understand. Hopefully people understand. Smooth. He says that in a purple uh, leather jacket straight out of uh, like Prince's World Tour in 85. It's working. It's all working for Jalen Hurts right now. Yeah, I mean, I think the one thing that, you know, we, we were, a year ago he was still essentially on audition for this job. I think now he's uh, my second choice for MVP. I mean, I know he missed a couple games at the end and, and it's played through this injury, but you mentioned this, Greg, last week, is that it is the player, but it is like the Eagles made this choice at quarterback and they moved away from Carson Wentz. You got this player, but I think they talked about his leadership and who he is the entire time. This was not a great performance by the Eagles offense for much of the game. They, their first half, they essentially was their fourth worst performance in the first half all season. That's something to do with the Niners defense, but it wasn't them. In terms them. of what? Well, just like efficiency and stuff. It was just sitting out there. And it's like, this was not the high powered version of Philly. It really wasn't. I think that it gives me hope that in the Super Bowl, you might get that version Against the Chiefs. Right. I I think to be more specific, and this is just my take personally, and I know the rushing numbers aren't crazy. They ended up 3.4 yards overall, but they they had some big plays. I think it was just a a subpar performance by Hertz specifically. I think he was struggling uh, to stay calm in the pocket. Uh, He wasn't accurate. He had that go ball to A.J. Brown on the second drive of the game. That would have made it 14-0. Just missed it. Had another... uh, ball way out of bounds on a go ball that like it ended a drive. Uh, he just didn't seem to be ready for whatever the 49ers defense was showing him. And he was not the first one. This is a great, great defense. And I think D'Amico Ryans was mixing it up. But the pressure, even when the pressure wasn't there, I think their plan really was uh, confusing him. And he had a 4.8 yards per attempt in this game. So he struggled uh, to pass the ball, especially in the first half. But it was his legs and better decisions in the second half that, that kind of calmed well, the game Well, if you take down. away that Devontae Smith catch, right? Right. The, it, his numbers, he finished with 36 yards. That was a 29-yard catch. A.J. Brown had four catches for 28 yards in the first quarter, essentially, and then never had anything else. It's like we're used to seeing when Hertz has been on the big plays down the field. Guys like Charvarius Ward, who played an awesome game, lost in this disaster of a situation for the Niners, took that away. I mean, this just was not the Eagles offense we're used to seeing when they're at their best. The Niners and Eagles QBs combined for 204 passing yards, the lowest in a conference title game since the 1982 AFC title game. That I mean, was, one of the quarterbacks literally couldn't throw, so that's right. I'm not totally surprised. But Right. That was the, uh, the famous mud bowl, uh, Jets and Dolphins. Brock Purdy couldn't throw. Here are his comments about the state of his arm after the injury. You know, my arm just felt like it stretched out. Um, just felt like really a lot of just shocks all over from my elbow down to my wrist, front and back. Um, just pain, really. And this is where it kind of got sad, to be quite honest with you, because we had all kind of enjoyed this rise of San Francisco's offense in the CMC Purdy era. Josh Johnson bangs his head on the turf in the third quarter. They they blow the game dead. He goes to the blue tent. He's done. He's diagnosed with a concussion. They have to bring back Purdy. Even after there's discussion, is Christian McCaffrey going to be the quarterback? Is Kyle Juszczyk going to be the quarterback? They bring Purdy back, and there's a chance Purdy blew out his elbow. We don't know yet. We're going to have a better idea how serious this injury is. Um, but he goes back on the field, 
and he explains the conversation he has with Shanahan about how bad it is and whether he can throw. And he's even sheepish, almost apologetic about what the state of his arm at, at this juncture of the season. Yeah, I told him right there, um, if we run a play, you know, I can't throw it deep. Like, I, just for this play at least, like, it's hurting really bad. And, you know, I just, if we're going to get a completion, have it be something short, if that's all right. And so that's really what I was telling him. <laughs> if that's all right. How Man. sad. It's sad. It's a bummer. It's um, I mean, I thought it's been one of the best stories of the year and so improbable. And to end this way again, it's just like the, the game is just filled with with what ifs, what ifs to me. And like I almost would have rather that you and I think like if you're Christian McCaffrey, there was a during especially during like if you're watching the truck feed, which we do on MVP in our in our office, like he was sitting there looking at a huge play sheet. And I could see the look on McCaffrey's face sort of like, wait a minute, I might be playing quarterback here. The guy's been on the team for like a couple months, right. you know. This is it's the sort game of to decide who's going to the Super Bowl and the running back is looking at the quarterback right, play no. sheet. It's it's just it's just the way it is. And yeah, like the Giants, you said they were kind of down in a lot. The Giants are feeling good against the Eagles, but they were clearly outclassed. The Niners, this is a whole different situation. Like yeah. it, the Eagles absolutely caught a break here. I think the Eagles are going to win uh, either way, but we'll never know what would have happened if these two sides were uh, at equal power. You see, you hear the frustration in a guy like George Kittle, who's had a big year with Purdy um, and having to answer questions about the situation and how things played out. How does that feel to lose in the NFC Championship game because I don't have a quarterback? Pretty yeah. sh- to be honest. Yeah, that's about it. It's fair. <laughs> it is two straight fair. years. I mean, this team looking at Shanahan on the sideline as you just, I guess he always looks like that, but it just like, I was just like thinking of what he is thinking as he's calling these running plays in the fourth quarter of the, and just thinking how the injuries have defined his time in San Francisco, especially a quarterback when Jimmy G first got hurt. And all the quarterbacks that they went through, they were healthy in 2019. They, they lost that one with a, a 10 point lead in the fourth quarter. But then you think the injury the next year. And then you think last year, Jimmy G playing through injury was the worst version of Jimmy G and blowing the 10 point lead in the fourth quarter of the NFC championship game. And then this, and you hate, you hate to like, like no one likes to hear it when their teams win, especially, or just anything. But it's like sports are very often about luck. And, championship teams the greatest players ever benefit from that it's just it's just part of it like you got to take advantage of it when you have that opportunity the eagles earn that one seed by having the best record in the league too and, and setting all of this up uh but luck is part of it and that was terrible luck for the 49ers they've had awful injury luck under shanahan and he's had to perform all sorts of acrobatics at the quarterback position for years on end. And it's like we spent all last offseason wondering if it would be Jimmy G or Trey Lance. And now you go into another offseason and we'll get into all that. But it's like what like there's a lot of questions at quarterback and what you do with a young oh rookie who looked fantastic. If, I mean, if this is a serious elbow injury for Purdy. That, I mean, it just keeps getting worse because then... Right, and he's got an MRI tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, so everything we'll, is snowballing yeah. and everything will roll into next season. They don't get a true fresh start next year. Um, any other thoughts kind of on this game before we move on? I, I think this this game, and maybe we'll talk about more in the coming weeks, but I, I do wonder if the NFL is going to look more closely at changing... Uh, the rules in terms of the rugby scrum and being able to push the quarterbacks. What do they call it? The butt? The, the butt the butt push? Well, it's like, I don't it's know. like a double what? cheek because you got double two guys pushing push. hurts. It's like a yeah. double cheek push. It, it, again, it was early in this game when we didn't really know what the final result was going to be. You never know with Josh Johnson. I mean, it is crazy looking at the final stats. The Eagles average under four yards per play. They still only ended up with 269. Uh, and like, yeah, I didn't know what was going to happen. And so those short yardage plays with Hertz felt really important, especially on the goal line. And I just sense like the frustration of how effective this, the Eagles are especially good at it. I think because of their offensive line and because of Hertz, but I expect the rules committee will be talking about this and we will be talking about it in March when, when they it, meet. It's almost crazy when you see teams and we've seen situations where it's fourth and a yard and they're not doing that play that they're trying something else because it, because the Eagles especially have trademarked it as like the most automatic fourth down maneuver out there. And yet like, it seems so automatic that I'm with you. It's like, it's something about it does seems a little well, off base to me. I usually, mean, usually the way, and one of the like beautiful things about football is 
Yeah, there's always a back and forth, like uh, the offense innovates or the defense innovates, and then the other side comes back. I don't know if this is something you can innovate because it's so cl- it's so up close and personal, and before you don't even really have an opportunity uh, to find a way to kind of combat it. So maybe it becomes that type of situation. I don't know. Like, is it does have the sport has its roots in rugby? Maybe maybe it's a beautiful callback I, to its. It- Ancestors. It doesn't it's bother fun to watch. Me. I don't. It yeah. doesn't bother me. I don't go nuts about it, it personally. It, it kind of <laughs> reminds me a little bit of like Belichick always had a, a way of taking advantage of like whatever the rules were. Sure. Like don't break them, but bend them as hard as possible. Take advantage of what the rules are. I think the Eagles have found a has have found something here. Like they have so many different ways to win games, and that's that's why I think this win, even though it was too one sided, was typical for them. Like. Any given week, different parts of their team step up and end up winning the game because any part of their team has a chance to be dominant. And, and that's what's that's what's special. That's why they're going there. Th- that was my thought, too. It's like uh, I'm not really into hearing about how easy their path was like they didn't mm. choose that. They also had an easier path because they were the best team in the regular season. But automatically, like one matchup, I know Landon Dickerson was hurt today, but their offensive line versus Chris Jones and friends in Kansas City. But then on the flip side, they're pass rushing their front seven versus a very good Chiefs offensive line there. I, I, you know, it would have mattered who made it for the AFC because they're so physical. I think the Chiefs have some strengths and some pluses where you can line up against the Eagles, but they have been so dominant up front that I wonder if it starts right there. Are you insinuating that the game is won in the trenches? I, I <laughs> wanted to insinuate it without saying that, but that's what this game was. Before we take a break, can we pull up um, the Empire State Building, which is the most iconic skyscraper in New York City? People should know that uh, the Giants were eliminated in embarrassing fashion by their hated rival, the Eagles, uh, a week ago. And after the game, uh, the Empire State Building sends out a tweet. Fly, Eagles, fly. We're going to green and white in honor of the Eagles NFC championship victory. And I know after the Chiefs won, they went red and white. And maybe this was some type of like pre-plan. And then whoever was in the planning meeting was like, didn't even realize there's levels to this. As a New York sports fan, I think about as someone that lived in Boston, Greggy, in 2001, when they threw Ray Bork a parade when he won the Stanley Cup championship for the Colorado Avalanche. That's how downtrodden the, the Boston sports were at that time. New York sports is in such a bad place now. (laughs) Where is the swagger? Where is the just the confidence and the belief that you are the sports town and nothing like that would ever happen in your most famous building? That's a disgrace, Empire State Building. That's a a disgrace. disgrace. It is a disgrace. And it's it's just to (laughs) me, it was so baffling. Like we're missing a part of the story. Maybe maybe we'll find out later that there's something to trigger this from a planning angle. But like the idea that uh, my first thought was like someone is in like, someone from Philadelphia is essentially uh, violent, like a violent coup d'etat fashion, taken over the nerve center of the Empire State Building. I'd almost and rather it was that. Right, that would make some sense. This makes how, the, what are we doing here from I, a PR I believe angle? that the confidence level of the sports area has been so battered by the failure to win titles for the most part in the last twenty years that we've lost our sense of identity. Our, 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 just our belief in self and our hatred of outsiders that pretend that they are us, Philadelphia v. New York. This can't happen, but, yeah. and it should never happen again. It should have never happened in the first place. And I'm not even a Giants fan, and it got me mad. Just imagine how Giants fans oh felt about God. that. Well, hold on, though. But even, even if you were – you're talking about the fact that the city is psychologically broken over sports. A and all little bit. Okay, but let's say even the, the, the reverse were true, and they were psychologically fine. Why, still, why are you doing this? I, I I'm like, saying it would have never happened. I know. I live. The city just, would be more keyed up and smarter to how understand on earth that was this, this ever would never happen. Thought to be a good idea on any level. Why are we celebrating other other cities I winning AFC and NFC it. titles? I used to games. live twelve blocks away from there, and it was one of the joys of living there. You always like looked up at the end of the day, you see the lights. And, like I used to follow that account no more because it's like I don't live there anymore. I don't care what the lights are. But the fact that but they, you're not a New York sports fan, Greg. Of course you you are fine with it. I would have been excited because I like the Eagles because it was such a total blunder. What are you talking about? But Greg, <laughs> but Greg, do 
you, you I, would have. But I, I we're, not, again, we're not asking what you think. Like if you, you were a Giants fan like living a in New York, I would look up at the green and white Empire State Building and say, oh, that is unbelievable. I'm saying I was li- if I was living there and they owned themselves that badly, I would have been dancing in the streets because it was like a dis- so just like a little dog total, like biting at your you ankle. Just, it's just, it's just it's a it's total disaster. But, you, but we're actually just asking how yes. this ever came oh, to I be. Mean, not I, whether or not this it's is my way of agreeing to- with you, of course. <laughs> it's a total disaster. And I have a theory. I don't okay. think they were going to do the Chiefs colors. They weren't going to do the. It was not a plan that it was going to go, oh, we'll do the winner's colors early and Ooh, the winner's colors pivot? late. Yeah. And then they got so much pushback, they realized, okay, here's how we can save it. We'll pretend panic pivot. that 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 hurt us yeah. and we're going to panic pivot. Uh, uh, talk about creating your own problems, though. I mean, there's, I, oh. uh, there must be more to this. I'm just saying, it's, it's hilarious to me. It's hilarious to me as a Patriots Get fan. Your, see that? See now? Okay. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Well, that's right. what I was. That's what I am. Okay. Uh, but that's not how you football. said it initially. Yeah. <laughs> I would feel the same way if I were a New England sports. <laughs> anyway, let's take a break. We'll take care of some business, and we'll get to the AFC title game. A corker. We just took a... Um, a break, and we we're talking about the Empire State Building the entire time. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think that's funny. Um, speaking of uh, green and white and the Eagles, listen, I'm a man of principle, integrity, bottomless integrity. <laughs> so I can say, what? So I can say. <laughs> Greg openly chuckling. <laughs> yeah. So I, mean, I can say he said bottomless integrity. That was <laughs> intended to get that reaction. No, that was supposed to be met with like a stone faced nod. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> so I can say that I went down in the locks challenge. I like that Eagles team too. I, I needed something special um, from the Niners, and what I got was an apocalypse for the San Francisco team. So. My time with the trophy is over. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and what I hold in my hand is the Locks title, which I, I treated with respect and dignity, unlike some other past champions. It's about the trophy. It's about me. But not anymore. Now, it is yours, Greg. And all I ask before I hand over this Locks trophy that you have won fair and square is that you treat it with respect mm, and dignity. It's a fair request. Uh, because it is a, a, an important part of our program. I put it in a very high visibility spot oh, okay. in my That's home what I'm studio. What are you getting yeah. at here? Yeah. And I just don't want this to be, because, you know, with Greg, it's my, I put it in my trunk and then I forgot about it. <laughs> be proud with this trophy because you did earn it. I don't so think Greg's I forgetting over. about this. Are you guys going to get the shot where I hand it over like it's uh, on the plane in Dallas at Love Field? Thank you, sir. There you go. Thank you, sir. Congratulations, Greg. Lock it up! <laughs> you earn it. How, how many titles is that for you now? Three? Yeah. I mean, look, you say I don't respect it. Me and this guy spent the whole <laughs> pandemic together. It's three out of four. You know, I, I do say luck is a huge part of it. But if I keep stacking these up, I'm going to have to start questioning Where, that theory. Where are you going to put it in your home? That theory. I guess I'll have to put it in my, my shot. I am moving soon, so I'll, I'll have to yeah. work on that. I, in the meantime, maybe we'll. Should we leave it here? No, I'll just leave it. She's beautiful. <laughs> you make me look at it next to me. I mean, if I feel time. like Joe Burrow. And I gotta say, you know, the the lock history was instructive because luck is very important here. Always is. And I I like the Eagles got some injury luck today that helped that game, but part of it was my lock history that mm. Patrick Mahomes was really the one who put me over the top for those previous locks. And even though I picked the, the Bengals today, thought they would win, I thought nice setup. it's it's just wrong. <laughs> it doesn't feel right to ever lock against Patrick Mahomes. Never do that. Right. If, if I'm Dan, I, I've equipped that with a like a hidden camera. <laughs> I do want to see what Greg's doing. In general, what is Greg doing in his house? I'd, I wouldn't always check on it, but I'd check on it occasionally. So... I don't know exactly what your Mahomes point was there. The, in the past was, years, okay, you've yeah. stacked wins picking the Chiefs. The, in the playoffs, yes. in that, that clinched my previous locks. It was Mahomes in the playoffs finishing out those lock titles for me. Got so it, it. felt, it felt uh, wrong and foolhardy to go against him. And I, and I would that, have been wrong. That part hmm. of the speech would have been even more effective if you picked the Chiefs and locked them up today for the title. <laughs> but sometimes it's the locks you don't make. You know what? Good call. And we thought, we all thought, 
old Zeus are included. I had the Cincinnati Bengals number one in the power rankings. Mm. That at Burrowhead Field, Joe, it would be his time. And these players, we could talk about luck and all this stuff. What's momentum? What's not momentum? What, what is momentum? We could talk about that. But motivation, you cannot discount what players use to get pumped up ahead of games. And you knew the Chiefs did not like everyone going Cincinnati's way and talking about Burrow is the new king of the hill when they had Mahomes to Arrowhead Field. 20 to 20 tie. Eight seconds remaining in regulation of the AFC Championship game. Harrison Butker, the biggest kick of his Chiefs life. Placement is down. Butker's kick is up. The spinning kick high. 40 in the air. And it is good. Good. It's a field goal from 45 yards out by Harrison Butker. You can doubt the Chiefs. You can dislike <laughs> the Chiefs. You're going to have to deal with the Chiefs as the AFC champions. Oh, <laughs> How about it. that? Everyone's connected. I'll give them the bang. I'll give them the bongos. bongos. Give them the bongos. Mitch Holtis with the call. Now, I love Mitch. He's off. He's off on this. W-D-A-F. Uh, because, and I'll admit this freely, when the Patriots are winning all these AFC titles and stuff, there was a certain exhaustion that set in for a lot of fans. The Chiefs are a little harder to root against to me. Like, I, don't, I didn't set, even though I wanted Cincinnati in this game, and Casey, they've earned yet another trip to the Super Bowl here uh, on the back of that Harrison Butker field goal with three seconds to play after Mahomes scrambled for a first down uh, late in regulation, got pushed out of bounds, one of the costliest penalties in recent NFL history by poor Joseph Asai. Um, 45 yards hook through the up, up the right. <laughs> up right. Who? Who? Sorry, hook him, I said. Joseph Asai? Yes. You Who's might. even speaking right now? <laughs> Who would how think many that weeks? Hook'em, Who would think that Hookem is worth it in this moment? Great digger, how do you bring up Texas football in this at this stage of the show? Sorry, <laughs> this is, I think it's a good bit. Continue. This is one of the lowest moments in uh, Texas alumni football in forever. Poor kid was just trying to make a play. Edit that out of the show. <laughs> the Chiefs oh win twenty three twenty to advance to the Super Bowl. Kansas City, Mark, finally beats uh, Cincinnati after three straight losses, including a three-point overtime loss in last year's title game. And before I throw it to you, Mark, when Tracy Wolfson of C uh, CBS uh, grabbed uh, Patrick Mahomes on the field to ask him about another big-time win in a what's already a legendary career at just 27 years old, his buddy, Travis Kelsey, came in mm. with the interview bomb yeah. of the century. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! Burrow had my ass! Whoa! It's Mahomes' house! It ain't Burrowhead. It's Mahomes' house. Now, that was a major misstep by the uh, Bengals fanatics and their mayor and everyone else to suggest all this business. Because, yeah, if you're another team in the AFC West or a fan base supporting another team in the AFC West or the AFC, you might have uh, annoyances with Mahomes and the Chiefs and what they are. But give me a break. We spent all week long wondering if Mahomes physically would be up to this game. You know, yes, he was practicing well and moving around, but what happens when you get into this thing with the temperature, what it was, you know, your body's chilling out. Like, Mahomes, to me, this was one of my favorite performances ever for him, and it was filled with so many little moments where, you know, he couldn't move the way you wanted him to. So even before that big run, that scramble that really showed exactly who Patrick Mahomes is, there were how many throws where with guys around him in the pocket, a crumbling pocket, he seemed to almost see through defenders and make these beautiful little dump offs. He had one to Isaiah Pacheco on that final drive. That final drive started with, you know, all his wide receivers are hurt in this game. They're, but neither team's really running the ball very well. He's not able to lean on that part of it. Sky Moore had the huge punt return. That set this thing up. Then you have the, the Mahomes to the Pacheco thing I was telling you before. There's an incompletion. Mahomes then runs for that first down, and that all of these games like this have that defining moment and that penalty. And I thought Cincinnati went, they, they dealt, at least this penalty was clean because they dealt with a lot in this game. And Zach Taylor was about to have his head explode. But this was an actually a good call. And Joseph Asai goes down in Ohio, Cincinnati mm. playoff history and lore in all the wrong ways mm -hmm. for what happened here. Because there's no way 
that Butker is going to make that field goal, I think, without that penalty. He hit the bottom of the net from what, whatever it was. It would have been close. Yeah. But, 45. I mean, it was very cold. I like, it didn't you, get a lot of attention, but it was 20. Feels like six. Freezing. They, they said, uh, Jay Feely, your guy. I know you really love the Jay Feely kicking uh, analysis, Dan. As, I, as I a, respect the guy's hustle for getting a paycheck for what, <laughs> what he does. Sure. He said that, settings. yeah, that he was only good from <laughs> 50, most likely 55 would have been a stretch. And yeah, it would have been, I think, a 60 yard attempt before that. I don't even know if they would have uh, attempted that play, although they might have had time for one more play before that. Just the fact that it came on Mahomes running and I know mm. it was the penalty that moved. I mean, you, you almost can't write this stuff and as much as the the Bengals fans are upset with that penalty are upset with how the rest of this game was officiated I think you have to look at Patrick Mahomes as a guy who lost Juju Mm Smith-Schuster lost McCole Hardman lost Kadarius Mm -hmm. Tony and ultimately their passing attack was a little more effective over the course of the game. He averaged 7.6 yards per attempt. He didn't uh, have an interception. I know he had that fumble where he just lost the ball. Uh, But it was a very evenly played game. I didn't feel like the Chiefs stole one. I felt like they just ended up winning it at the end by three, just like the Bengals ended up winning close games by three against the Chiefs previously. And this is why sports are great. They're unpredictable. Everything did seem to be trending toward... This is the Joe Burrow ascension. This is this is why everyone was confidently saying that this is Burrowhead and he owns Kansas City. And, and then it gets set up on a platter uh, for them after the big touchdown to make it 2020. They force a punt, a, f- a whole mess of things going on on that Kansas City drive. Is that the drive with all the shenanigans with the play that wasn't the play? Yeah, where he had like no, eight, was eighth, eighth down. We it ended da- up being yeah. eight plays, 13 yards. We dodged a couple, put it this way, we dodged a couple of bullets of officiating gone sideways uh, where it looked like it was going to have a major impact on the game and luckily it sidestepped uh, those type of situations. You just wanted to talk about two great teams playing and that's what we're, get to, we're getting to do for the most part here. But they get two chances with the ball. Uh, in a tie game, one a possession ends in an interception. And after the Cincinnati defense steps up again and forces another punt, Greg, uh, the Bengals get the ball back. They get, I think, one first down and then they go, they punt again. And and, and that surprised me, I got to say, because especially the last possession where it's Bur- balls in Burrow's hands with two minutes to play in a tie game. It kind of just felt like that was the moment. And when they got stopped there and all of a sudden there was, you know, time on the clock for the Chiefs after the big punt return, huge play in the game by Sky Moore. It felt like this thing was going to go a certain way. And it did. So that second drive and you're right, they got the ball in a tie game twice in the fourth quarter and couldn't score. And so you have to give the Chiefs defense a lot of credit. Give the Chiefs offensive line credit. Other people other than Mahomes lifted up Mahomes, which hasn't always been the case. But on that second drive, Dan, they did have two first downs. They had the 10-yard play to Higgins. They were on their own goal line practically. Then they right. have the third and 16 after the intentional grounding, which felt like it might be a killer play. And Burrow gets protected, really lets go of the ball. And he did a great job uh letting go of the ball quickly all game after all those early sacks. He knew he had to get rid of it. Great timing route. Uh, They blow the coverage to Hurst. They get 23 yards. That was incredible. At that point, we're all, I mean, you already said they're going to go down the field. It's over. At that point, kiss of death. I think Chiefs fans, I think Bengals fans, I think America is thinking game over. They have a two yard play to Hurst where it doesn't get out of bounds. And that's where England was like, not quite. <laughs> Greg and Dan and Mark. That, that's the moment where the game kind of changed. And we, we were talking about it in the film room at the time. It was in a very aggressive timeout by Zach Taylor with 48 seconds left. I think a lot of coaches. And in the moment, I thought, maybe don't take that timeout. That you run the next play 15 seconds later, you kind of play it both ways. You keep your two timeouts, but you make it so that there's no time left for the Chiefs if you don't end up picking up first down. I can't kill Zach Taylor for that at all. Him going for fourth down, and like on the fourth and sixth earlier in the game, him being aggressive throughout this run and trusting Joe Burrow is why they made it this far. Got it. So I, I can't kill him, but him trusting Joe Burrow and trusting his offense and being very aggressive with that timeout is why the Chiefs got the ball back ultimately when the Bengals couldn't get a first down. And also 
uh, Chris Jones having the sack of the game. I mean, right. he's he, right. Chris Jones. <laughs> like, it's a little. Uh, you're, you're, there's so much mechanics around the drives and the quarterbacks, but like Chris Jones absolutely was the star of this game. And, and the, I, the back history of Jones, he had played in 13 postseason games, zero sacks, yeah. and then two tonight. He was super frustrated last year after that loss. So to come back and do what he did, and I mean, I'll give Zach Taylor another bit of credit because I, I mean, this this was a tough environment. I think they were sort of saying this was as loud as as Romo had ever heard Arrowhead Stadium, that it was on fire, the weather was a factor. And the way that that game started, you just sort of could you could wonder if the Chiefs were just going to run away with it because Burrow behind the line that played so well a week ago was getting destroyed, and it was a total train wreck. I thought the Bengals did a good job down the stretch of adjusting to some of that stuff and adding bulk in the backfield and chipping Chris Jones and others to try to keep Burrow safe, who's so great with the quick throws, but... You're right. I mean, they had two chances. This isn't the this isn't the Josh Allen Mahomes game where you go into the offseason wondering what if Cincinnati and Burrow had one more opportunity because he was lucky he threw two picks in this game. That second pick, which was tipped by Brian Cook and landed in the hands of Josh Williams, was an incredible defensive play by the Chiefs. Those guys are rookies. They got a secondary essentially built of rookies and held their own mm-hmm. in this thing. And the Burrow's both picks resulted in zero Chiefs. Chiefs points, where Mahomes had that crazy fumble, which was a very un-Mahomes-like play. That led to a Cincinnati touchdown that again made me think, this is just going Cincinnati's way in these little tiny moments. And for Mahomes and the crew to pull it out, it's just another reminder. It's like they're hard to describe because they seem so perfect when they are. Same with Mahomes. But this was a different way that Mahomes won. This was a resourceful win, like a tough win. I don't think people think of the Chiefs that way. And, and and of course, they think of them as mentally tough. They came back from 10 down in the in the Super Bowl to win. But where so much went against them. And the Bengals fans will say, we didn't have our offensive linemen. Sure, but going into this game, not only was Kelsey supposedly a little banged up, although he looked fine, and we know about Mahomes, but losing three receivers and Legereus Sneed, your best cornerback, all in the game, and to be able to overcome that, it, it really wasn't just Mahomes. It was the Chiefs defense getting those steps. It was the offensive line doing a great job. Their running game did nothing, but they did a great job protecting Mahomes for the most part. Like this is a toughness, a resourcefulness that like championships are made of. And like we're giving all this credit to Mahomes and we should have given it to him anyways. But if the Chiefs give up a field goal on that last drive, like we're not giving them all the same credit. So it is a team sport. And and he got lifted up by his team more than he has in the past. And we saw that in each of the last Two weeks yep. uh, where, of course, Mahomes went down with the injury last week and they were able to survive. And And I thought the Mahomes injury, I, I thought it was fairly remarkable that for the first at least half of the game, you wouldn't even really know that he was injured because he was making all the type of plays that you're used to him making um, as the game went on, especially on one scramble where he threw off on a completion. He had a really drive off the ankle. And that from that point on, he was limping pretty badly. But this again what separates him when you're talking about like Dak last week, what, what's the difference between the great guys and the good guys, the guys that win Super Bowls and the guys that just make a lot of money and make it to the playoffs every couple of years. He somehow in that, in that physical state is able to turn on the juice and turn that corner before he gets pushed out of bounds, get the first down. And it's just, I just have so much respect for Mahomes, the player. And uh, I know I'm not alone. No. And I mean, you look at his two touchdown throws, like that first one to Travis Kelsey on fourth and one. Again, I love the aggressive nature of what they did there. That touchdown dart was insane. And then the MVS one on the move. I mean, Mahomes like found a way to, I'm sure he's in pain because he was hobbling around late in that game too. And yet there was a couple times where he threw off his back foot and looked as good as ever. It's like he he just in this moment, I think that's the thing about when you rooted for teams that can't find a quarterback, whether even if they're good, but they're not available half the time. It's like, you got nothing. Mahomes is like available and good. And he's playing through something that would keep other people off the field. I, I think he's he's the best I've seen come, come into the NFL. And I think this game shows how he's more than just scrambling around. That that Kelsey touchdown you mentioned, we we were commenting, like, look, he had a wide open. It's fourth down. He had a wide open player in the flat. That's oh, where the right. play yep. call was supposed to go to. But he holds on to it looking for more and he gets it to Kelsey. And then the touchdown to MVS where he moved up in the pocket was a dart. But just a few plays before that on that drive, the one, the one play you're talking about, Dan, on the third down where he plants, he's rolling left. And Romo mm-hmm. did a good job pointing out if you have a high ankle sprain, like that's the play where it's really going to hurt you the most. And it did. He's rolling left, throwing right. Like most quarterbacks can't make that play healthy. Like I'm a fan of the Patriots. There's no way Mac Jones can possibly make that play healthy. He does it on that injury, playing through the pain completely 
completes it, continues that drive, and then ends up hitting MVS later. That's just next level stuff. Yeah, and going back to the, the play you mentioned, like that's a – the touchdown is fourth – and one, correct? Yeah. yeah. Like that is that's a fourth and one in the AFC championship game. <laughs> and you have a guy open in the flat for a three yard gain. But and this goes back to their, you know, historic connection level. He sees Kelsey, who's not necessarily open initially, but he sees him basically one on one in the end zone. And, and he knows Mahomes. I put the ball in a certain spot. Ninety nine out of 100. Kelsey's going to give me a touchdown. Those guys just operate on a different level than almost anybody we've ever seen as well. So a lot of, did I mention Travis Kelsey talking smack after the game? Oh. We saw him do it with Tracy Wolfson. How about the mayor of Cincinnati? Now we know we have some connections with mayors of Cincinnati. Our buddy Jason, who lived in Cincinnati, moved to Tybee and became the mayor of Tybee. I want to make it clear. I would say equal power. It's not the same guy. E- equal no, power. it's not the same person. It's not Jason uh, from Cincinnati who became the mayor of Tybee. This is whoever the mayor of Cincinnati is. Maybe Gravedigger helped me out with that. Um, uh, had some unkind things to say about the Chiefs and, and some uh, sticking out the chest about his, his favorite team, the Cincinnati Bengals. Kelsey wasn't done uh, during his post-game riser conversation. Oh <laughs> hey, I got some wise words for that Cincinnati mayor. Know your role and shut your mouth, you jabroni. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he could absolutely be a professional wrestler. First of all, he's holding the Lamar Hunt trophy while he does it. Then he holds his hand out to his ear to hear 74,000 uh, Kansas City fans lose their mind Wait. over his rock act. Again, like the the mayor, what are you doing Like in the week leading up to this? It's That's like, what I, mayors do. Mayors? I, I, I know, the worst. but like this, Let's be honest. I think that it, it, it contributed. It's so <laughs> clear that that was like a, a vital piece of motivation inside the locker room. I agree. I think motivation, that's one thing you take away from today. Like these players will look for anything. And I think it goes a long way, especially when you have something like this. This is kind of like a perfect storm. You were able to draw on this motivation that, oh, this team is better. Everyone says this team is better than us. This was the Chiefs, mm-hmm. uh, 14 wins. They're in at home, and their quarterback is Patrick Mahomes. So they're able to summon all of that and blast it back. But, Greg, like, ultimately, I, we say all I'm, this. I'm glad the mayor said it. We, I, oh, no, know, I think it makes, makes it, it more, more fun. fun. And it's just fun to dunk on him afterwards. Do I think that affected oh, well, the game that, in any and way? The mayor, no, and the mayor would have done a victory lap for three right, weeks right, if, right. if it would have went the other way. But I think you, that's all good. Do I, you think it, it did it obviously got it rose, and, rose up enough like in the sea level to get into the Chiefs locker room. And it's the first thing Travis Kelsey mentioned. Because I, I'm I'm sure they couldn't wait to talk about all that. And and I'm sure like they were talking about it amongst themselves. Do I think that that made any difference in all the like 15 different plays that helped decide this game? Like including. No, no I don't think so. I think no, it's just I mean, I, like I, it's I, in like, your like, heart. I guess but I'm I don't more know. saying from a like the Bengals a year ago were this wonderful I'm not story. This loss on the no, not at all. But like they 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 <laughs> got to be like, clear. their whole thing around the Bengals like turned a little bit of a corner the last two or three weeks where it's like suddenly they were the favorites going into Arrowhead and Mahomes was being outshined by Joe Burrow, who was who, who the mayor basically said they needed to do a paternity test the mayor? on Mahomes Great because mayor. you think he's Joe Burrow's right. his, he's Joe Burrow's I mean, father. The problem is that he delivered that press conference that video with like absolutely zero uh like i mean swag and attitude if you're mm. gonna do it you gotta do it well are you voting for that guy i wouldn't i didn't know who the mayor was so i asked somebody to help me figure it out the what? mayor of cincinnati <laughs> is aftab pure of all <laughs> thank you that's Bridget. correct unplug her immediately thank you um anyway other thoughts um, no, what I was saying was, <laughs> despite all of this, and we can yeah. talk about uh, the greatness of Mahomes and how this is really a well-balanced team. It's not just about the quarterback. When we talk about the silent motivations that now came out right after the game, they still just squeezed by Cincinnati. Mm-hmm. And if you're a Bengals fan, it's like, man, these are the glory days, but these are two back-to-back. I, I don't even remember what it's like anymore. It's been so long. But when you when you become a good game, a good team, and you get close – and then you get turned back for it to happen twice in a row at this big stage. That's mm. very difficult. That's tough. I feel for the Westlings, everyone in the Cincinnati Zoo. Um, that that's that's tough. And Spice they have rack. to figure out spicy. He yeah. wa- he he did not want. I, I have the sympathy for Asai. Uh, you your heart broke watching him like break down in tears and not leave the bench. Spice Rack, on the other hand, wanted him off the team um, before the the plane leaves. So it no. felt, felt a little harsh. 
That does. Well, feel if you leave him in Kansas City, he also was injured. So right. and, he also had a great game. Uh, and can aside. we also like? I know there. I think there was eight seconds left when uh, the penalty occurred. Mahomes was going to make one more play there in my Ooh. heart, and I hope Asai realizes that too, and maybe he gets some peace from that yeah, because but- ultimately he, it wasn't a dirty play. It was a guy that was trying desperately to make a play, but it wasn't a bad call. He was Mahomes was on both feet were on the white line. A mistake that can't happen, and it will haunt the Cincinnati fans forever. I, I agree. I think Mahomes probably would have found another way to to win potentially, but that's not how this works. I mean, Joseph, Joseph Asai's name is going to go down in infamy, whether he be, he doesn't deserve it as a person, but that's the way this stuff happens. It, Ernest what? Spiner's fumble still talked about decades later. It shouldn't be lost. Would either. you like to talk about it? No, I feel like there's nothing more to say about it, but it it, it colors the rest of your career. Do you want to hear from Mahomes talking about once again <laughs> the mayor of Cincinnati? Oh boy, in part. Let's hear it. Yeah, I mean, you got Burrowhead. You say, I mean, they beat us last time. They were talking about, we, we got to play them. There was a lot of stuff. I mean, the mayor came at me, man. I mean, <laughs> I, mean I understand he's the mayor of Cincinnati, so he has to think about something. But, uh, I mean, it's Ooh. It, it's something that you just got to play the football game and then let your play do the talking. Not since the mayor of Amityville and Jaws has there been such a guy no, that came out of a situation with more egg on his face. This guy's having a bad uh, Sunday. <laughs> I um, I don't think it should be lost that Sky Moore set that thing up huge, and that was yeah. a really fascinating decision uh, by Andy Reid to put Sky Moore back there. So Sky Moore, who they took in the second round, and in fantasy heads like thought he was gonna be a huge asset to their team, kind of ended up being a disappointment, being a fourth or fifth receiver that couldn't get on the field much, was a bit of a disaster as a punt returner throughout the course of the season. Kept fumbling. They ended up benching him on punt returns, and Kadarius Tony turned into their punt returner. But Kadarius Tony gets injured early in this game. It, it, you know, poor Tony can't, just can't stay on the field, was out yeah. early Planted in this his game. Foot, his leg, and it just didn't look right. And so Moore, as the backup punt returner, gets put in that spot to make the big play. And look, that was the drive, was the punt return. They Absolutely. barely had to move the ball after that. That so brought it to the Kansas him. City 47. I mean, if you if you if if that's a five-yard return or something like that, I don't they don't win that game. There's not enough time. You know, we haven't, like, mentioned uh, – like what the Bengals did well in this game to, to set it up because it wasn't running the ball. I was, I was a little stunned how poorly uh, they ran the ball. Mixon was eight for 19. Burrow had a couple runs. He was their leading rusher uh, by eight yards per. He had the longest rush on the day. For right. Yeah. And, and the, the, in the biggest two rushes for the Chiefs, by the way, were their last two plays of the game, a six yard run and a five yard run. Those were the two longest runs. So no one could run the ball. But the touchdown that T Higgins had like skying over Watson and the, the fourth down play where Burrow, you know, launches it to chase and chase just has a filthy move to get down the field where he sort of fakes going inside gets cooked, turned around. Like those were just two plays that, I think is what helped make us feel like, oh, the Bengals are going to come win this game. Like these wide receivers are just too good. They're just such badasses to win like that, that eventually we'll see more of those plays, but it just didn't happen in the fourth quarter. Hmm. You hope. Like we saw the good Burrow is kind of what I'm saying. Like it wasn't like made this was a bad throws. game. Yeah. It was a great performance by both of them until the end. But Joe Burrow's not used to losing. And uh, he's been a winner his whole life. And yeah, he'll just like he'll have to live with, Aaron Donald chasing him down on fourth down at midfield of the Super Bowl. God, those two possessions at a tie game. It was all there for Cincinnati. And it once again, they fall just short. And now we get, and I think, and we're going to, we have two weeks and we're going to be going to Phoenix. Um, we're going to break down the game. Let's break it down tonight. Yeah, we could get into it right now, but I'll just say this. Kansas City, like we said, tons of injuries. Mahomes clearly still not 100%. Far from it. Uh, They're going to need every day of this um, leading up to the game, uh, especially against that Eagles defense that had, I don't think, I think they're up to around 80 plus sacks now overall in the season. It's it's, going to be, uh, it's going to be great. Two one seeds will be going at it on, on February 12th. Hamana, Hamana, Hamana. So the Chiefs opened as one and a half point favorites right off the bat and immediately uh, all the money went to the Eagles, and now the Eagle like, and, uh, and the Eagles are now favored by two and a half points. It'll maybe it'll settle down there, but that's kind of like Chiefs Bengals, where it went back and forth. But initially, it, it almost seemed like people were waiting for the Chiefs to be the favorites, and once they saw it, like a lot of people went Philly. 
doesn't really matter. Like either way, they're barely favored is what I would say. I feel like this is a, um, yeah, it feels like an Eagles by two and a half. In terms of hmm. the betting line. I think that's where it's going to land, right around there. That's what it is, at least at this moment. So you've got a, your finger on the pulse. they should be favored. Hmm. Interesting. Kelsey Bowl. I mean, uh, our old producer, TD, is one of the big winners today because he's, uh, I think, producing their, we, their podcast. We're going to be Kelsey hearing Brothers. so much about that that I'd, I'd it, almost suggest we don't dive into that anymore It's literally the best thing tonight. to ever happen to a podcast is yeah, uh, this. Exactly. Not since the Harbaugh <laughs> v. Harbaugh Bowl. We now get the Andy Reid versus uh, his old team bowl, Eagles, Chiefs. Let's hear from the Big Red. Yeah, I had a great time there. So, uh, 14 years, <laughs> long time, huh? And um, I'm happy for them. I'm happy for the city. Um, uh, they're passionate. They love football. I, mean, I can't wait till uh, Kansas City and Philly clash. It's gonna be. It's gonna be awesome, man. I mean, what a great, what a great Super Bowl will be. It is gonna be a great Super Bowl. Get ready for I that hope. answer, like 47 yeah, more times. He'll handle it well. And again, Mitch Holtis, love him. He's not right. I'm not. I love Andy Reid. Love saying he's going to be the big game. Mahomes, like uh, one of the greats. We're going to get to watch him in another Super Bowl. And a little bit of that's an important game in the Mahomes mystique. I mean, he's he's now gotten back to the Super Bowl for the third time. The true greats. If you want to go get the goat, Tom Brady, you're going to have to start stacking titles. And he's just 27 years old. He's got time to do it. Humana, humana, humana. And if you're Joe Burrow, like you, I know that you've declared the Super Bowl window open eternally for yourself, and I love that, that that he says that. But it gets harder and harder to get back. I mean, this is like this is the difference between I like to say that football and basketball are completely different, and you've same been known would apply to, say to, that. to baseball. But in baseball, you've got like football ten days in a series than basketball. You got like ten days to find out your team's sort of melting down. You can right. get swept to go to game seven. Football, it's like bang, it's suddenly over. It is, like this yes. morning, bang, it's like one one little drive, one little play. It's like That's the Niners. Check you later, Bengals. They woke up thinking they were gonna be Super Bowl champions by ten plays they into just, the second quarter. It was all gone. It had all went gone to dust. The brutal nature. Well, and well, I, I would think, say nothing has any meaning. I don't think one player <laughs> can dominate in football like you can in basketball. But these AFC teams with Burrow. And Mahomes, and we'll throw Josh Allen in there absolutely as well. They're all young players here. Like, and then the contracts are going to get more complicated. Burrow might get a contract this offseason. T. Higgins will be coming up soon, maybe for a contract. Like, it'll get more complicated. But these teams in the AFC, I know they're not all going to always be three of the final four teams, but I think for the other 13 teams in the AFC, it's a little scary to think about that Burrow and Mahomes and Allen with these good organizations are going to keep getting a crack at it for the next eight, 10 years on these teams. It's a little scary. I hear that. I hear that. All right. (laughs) Coming up this week, um, we're going to have Baldy on the show on Tuesday. He's going to give us some X's and O's early kind of breakdown of the He's week like to come. He's like an Eagles expert, too. He's been bathed in Philly Eagles football for Absolutely. a decade plus. It's a great booking. It always is. Uh, we'll have our, as per tradition, don't say the Super Bowl episode next week. Uh, and then a, a week after that, we are in Phoenix to cover the whole thing. A lot of special guests lined up. We can't wait. And before we say goodbye, we can't. We can't not bring this up. Yeah. Mostly, be- usually when it's a birthday, like you give the person a birthday gift. Mm. No, no, no. Zeus is giving himself a gift because there's nothing that Drew Christensen, our eight foot four video show producer, would hate more than being specifically pointed out that it is his 35th birthday. And if you want, he just pulled off oh, his headset and disgust, wheeling <laughs> out of the shot on our video program. That's why you got to check us out on YouTube for this kind of action. But now it puts Parker, you know, front and center. So that's oh, great. Yeah, well, she wasn't front and center uh, when we wanted to hang out with her uh, a week ago. No, right? a no show, in fact. The, a total no show. Big time no show at our live show. Uh, anyway, back, Drew, happy back. birthday, buddy. 35 years young. Nine feet, 11 inches tall. Told me he's going ice skating to celebrate. Well, he's nimble of foot despite being a, a massive man. All right. Thank you to everyone. Again, February 12th, two weeks from tonight, we will know the champion of the NFL. It's all come to this. And it will be our 10th Super Bowl as a podcast. Wow. Thank you for uh, the journey, giving us a great life. Can't wait. What game is it? 272? Something like that? You do the math. You're the Nailed math guy. It. <laughs> Don't tell me if I'm wrong. He's the call. <laughs>